So you can see why we're not reading that all the time. <laughs> A little different things going on in the second letter to the Corinthians. And in fact, once you get to this part of scripture, you really start to see the cracks in what it means to be a community together. And so let's go on a little journey of remembering how money was talked about from Jesus the whole way to this letter to the Second Corinthians. Not a comprehensive thing, but I think you'll get the gist pretty quickly. So for example, Jesus said something like, you should sell all your possessions. Okay. And that was pretty much it. I don't know. I mean, you can think back to the Gospels. Can any of you recall any scriptures where Jesus was like, you should sell all your possessions except for the ones you have tied up in savings, and probably you need a comfortable house, and also some of you can do this, but others can do this. And, you know, not so much. Jesus was like, here it is, to the point. Great. So if you remember, we spent a lot of time this spring in the book of Acts. We also made it then in the early book of Acts, sort of the earliest church gathering together. That's that famous story of people selling their possessions and holding things in common and being together. And we even read that story of Ananias and Sapphira, who sort of withheld some of their possessions and then were struck down dead <laughs> because they didn't, you know, share with the community. So it was a little more complicated than what Jesus was saying, but... It was still pretty dramatic to say, if you have material possessions, they are to be shared in community. This is part of the radical inbreaking of the kingdom of God that no one goes without. And part of that happens is when we make great sacrifices together. But now we've made it to 2 Corinthians. And as it turns out, people have been living together and trying to figure out the work of churches and things have gotten really messy. And in part because there's not just one church, but there are many churches. We see this just in the shape of the New Testament, where there's the letter to the Corinthians, but also to the Galatians or to the Ephesians. These are all groups of people who are having unique problems and issues and celebrations. And in fact, these people are not the same. We do not say the people of Bedford and the people of Bratnall have the same problems. You wouldn't clock that immediately. If I said the letter to the people at Bedford and the letter to the people at Bratnall, you'd be like, hmm, I wonder what that's going to say, right? Insert many other sort of city names and places. We know things are imbalanced in the world, and the same is true for the time of the Second Corinthians. But what is also interesting about this letter is that we get to see Paul talking to people over a period of time. We get to see his sort of like, love is going to save us. And then we see how over time in his relationship with these people, they were getting into the nitty gritty of what it meant to have life together, which was these fights and sort of challenges about who had money and resources and who did not. One of the themes of our letters in the New Testament is Paul is going around asking people for money. It's called a collection. He's looking to gather it, to sort of redistribute it to other churches. So to take from people who have enough, to try to give it to people who don't. And so we begin to see Paul as not just like, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think, but we get to see Paul as fundraiser. And he gets a lot more diplomatic really quickly. And we get to see him actually trying to work with people to name complicated, complicated things. And it's maybe not complicated in the heart of what Paul is trying to get, get to, which I think is back to that original message of Jesus, which is <clears throat> for us to live a world of sort of love and justice some people are going to have to give everything up, and that's how we come to this world of justice. But Paul realizes, I think, that when you actually look at people, is it really going to work if you say, sell everything, and then they don't? And then you're like, well, I guess that's the end of that. 
And so that's what we get a little bit of, is I think just the reality of what it means to be in the world when Paul says things like, it's a question of fair balance. Maybe at first, if you hear, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor, that doesn't go over very well. But if you try to talk and say, but really take a look at what you have. Do you have more than others around you? Then maybe you need to do something about that. And I invite you actually to go back through. Um, I only read just a brief section of this letter, but Paul goes on for this for chapters in the book of 2 Corinthians. And I would read them and you would get more confused by the minute because he's kind of all over the place because he's really trying to name complicated things. And so part of what he goes on to talk about, this is later like in chapter 9, is he's also trying to do this difficult thing of not forcing people into this Christian community of sharing money and resources, but he's trying to make it so people do so willingly and even cheerfully. Which honestly, like, way to go, Paul. Like, props to you for trying to do that. But he really tries to make this something where people internally can feel the shift of what it means to live generously. That it's very hard to compel that from someone. But it creates great beauty and cheerfulness and uh, a generosity that only sort of expands and continues when people are able to share what they have. I think what I like best, though, about what these sort of messy letters of Paul offer to us is a thing that I think I really struggle with and that I think we as a church always really struggle with, which is, um, as you may know, uh, we are not Paul, we are not sort of in Corinth, but here in Bedford, we're still doing some fundraising. We're still talking about money because here we have a building and staff and ministries that require actual tangible resources like money to support the ongoing mission and ministry of this church. And it's pretty easy to say, would you give and give generously? And it's very hard to talk about the nuances that that is not a message that is heard equally by all people. And I actually think that's what makes me really love this stuff from the book of 2 Corinthians, because Paul is really trying to name that there are people in these Christian communities that have more wealth than others. And he is trying to name that there are some who do not have it. And that that is not their task then, to become poor if they are already poor. And he's trying to name all of these complexities. And that's not really like a classic part of fundraising, right? And yet I think it's at the heart of what it means to be a Christian community, which is to be willing to get into the weeds with these stories and with these communities, which is not just, well, God will bless you, good luck, but... It's difficult to be in community together and to figure out how to pay the bills and how to redistribute wealth and how to think about making something where there is a fair balance. What a deeply challenging thing. And I have to admit, uh, I have sort of come to change my mind about some of these things in the church world. And one of the ways that this happened is I have a lovely friend, her name is Cheryl Johnson, she's a pastor out in California, and she wrote this book that I gave to some of you and I will continue to give out copies of, um, called Serving Money, Serving God. And it's this book that talks about what it means to be a Christian community and deal with money, basically. And in this book, she really names things that I think are important for us to hear. So. Um, I'm going to read sort of a paragraph from this book that talks about what I think are challenges, which is just basically to learn how to not be so uncomfortable about talking about difficult things. And I think that's what Paul models, and I think this is what Cheryl's going to invite us to as well. So here's what she writes. 
She says, one reason we sometimes avoid conversations about money is that we are afraid to offend or to admit the ways that we have been and are offending by participating in economic injustice. One feature of some mainline congregations is a desire to offer a big tent and to avoid taking a stand on difficult topics. Denominations and ecumenical organizations may release powerful statements on difficult topics, but many individual congregations avoid talking about potentially divisive issues. But in trying to be all things to all people, we may end up being nothing to anyone, or at least nothing of much importance. Jesus wasn't impartial in situations of injustice, and we need to find the courage to follow his lead. And to me, I think that's at the heart of why I hope we can continue to talk about money and resources as a community. And I think it's because I do see the connecting thread between Jesus and Paul. I think they're talking about the same thing, which is how do we create a world where there is more justice, where there is more balance, where there aren't people without. And so that's why I am confident when we put out fundraising things from South Haven because I know when I say we would like your money, it's not because it's a cash grab for my private jet, um, but instead it pays the electric bills so our hunger freezer centers can continue to run. I can say I would love us to share our resources to help fund my salary because I know when people in the community come and need help from a pastor, I don't like take a look and say, are you on our membership rolls? Because you know if you're not, you can't talk to me. No, when people come for help, do you know what I say? I'm here, I'm a pastor, I'm here to help you, and your work helps equip that. I think we talk about fair balance because we say here in Bedford, it's important that there is a church community like ours where LGBTQ people can come where our ministries are active and ongoing, and where there becomes more of a fair balance, where people are not left out or left behind. And so I invite you, as you see these things coming from the church and from the congregation, that you find the courage in there to recognize that you are a part of this in some way, shape, or form. And that maybe it's because you have the wealth and generosity to share and give. Maybe it's because you have the resources and community connection to say, you don't have the resources, but you know who to ask. Maybe it's because you believe that message of Jesus saying, sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And that makes you an advocate for speaking loudly in moments of economic injustice. And maybe you can find yourself in sort of the messy complexity of what Paul wrote to the people of Corinth, but I think still to us today, which is it takes a lot of conversation and a lot of ongoing letters and community togetherness to figure this out. But I have faith that God is still with us when we do this, that we are still following the path of Jesus to figure it out. And I am so grateful for you, the people of South Haven, for not shying away from uh, the administration of all of this. One more sort of final favorite thing. Uh, I liked that in 2 Corinthians, some of our translations have it that it says that Paul says that we are administrating this generous undertaking for the glory of the Lord. And I just like that it has that word administration in there <laughs> somehow. Um, so I am grateful for the tangible and specific and messy and financial work we do. And I'm glad that it is part of the story that Jesus started, that Paul continued, and that we are a part of even now. So may we hear the call of Jesus in the specific way that it applies to us, and may we learn to listen to one another and do so with great generosity. Thanks be to God. Amen.